singularity. My name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and you're watching Singularity FM, the place where we interview the future. There are those of us who philosophize and debate the finer points surrounding the dangers of artificial intelligence, and then there are those who dare to go into the trenches and get their hands dirty by doing the actual work that may just end up making the difference. So if AI turns out to be like the Terminator, then I would say Professor Roman Yampolsky may turn out to be just like John Connor, but only better. Because instead of fighting by using guns and brawn, he is utilizing computer science, human intelligence, and code. So whether that turns out to be the case and whether Roman Yampolsky will be successful or not is to be seen. But at this point, I am very happy to have Roman back on my Singularity FM podcast. Welcome, Roman. Thank you. It's by far the best intro I ever had. So that's the reason I keep coming back. I just love what you do. <laughs> Thank you very much. My pleasure. And, uh, you know, for those of our viewers and listeners who may have missed uh, the first uh, previous two interviews with you, I highly recommend them because uh, over there we go not only into your own personal background, but even more so into your own uh, professional work. And there's a lot to be learned there and a lot to be gained by going back and checking out those podcasts. So I suggest people who haven't done that uh, do that. However, today, the topic of our conversation would be Professor Yampolsky's latest uh, book, which is called Artificial Intelligence, Safety and Security. Uh, now, uh, this is not the book. This is like the early sort of uh, review manuscript version that I was very privileged to have access to. Uh, and I'm very grateful to Roman for that. Uh, but And so in addition to this book, we're also going to discuss some of the latest uh, general developments in the field of AI. So Roman, uh, let me start uh, with some general questions first. Uh, what do you think of sort of the impression at least that AI is now everywhere and the talk of everybody in contrast to the previous two conversation contexts that we had before? And the last one was three years ago. So I agree, but I think it's part of our bubbles. Both of us kind of work and uh, live technology and future. And so I do sometimes venture out of my bubble and I realize that like 90% of people don't know and don't care about anything I live and love. So they don't know about cryptocurrencies, AI, machine learning, singularity. Those are completely foreign terms for them. So we have to keep in mind that we are not the general, general audience. Mm -hmm. But then again, you have people like uh, in the last three years since our last conversation, you've had a number of super famous people like Bill Gates, Elon Musk, even before that, Stephen Hawking, Steve Wozniak. Uh, the United Nations had been discussing um, autonomous weapons. Max Tegmark went there and did a presentation together with uh, Professor Nick Bostrom. Uh, we had the launching of the uh, Silomar uh, conference of AI, which of course you went and you were present to. Um, uh, we had the the sort of the open letter or the open call to ban autonomous uh, weapons that got a lot of coverage. Maybe something like Max Tegmark told me they had like something like two thousand headlines, or I forget, but but thousands of them. Isn't that a sign that it's kind of permeate percolating to the top of the? media maybe but you kind of described again the people in my bubble <laughs> you didn't mention anyone outside of it so i think it supports my point that yes all the people interested in technology and ai are definitely more serious about impacts of this technology how much of it actually gets uh, delivered to real people is still questionable because it goes through this filter of media and uh, the state of journalism if you think it's bad in politics it's much worse in technology way worse. So uh, I give a lot of public talks for different uh, professional conferences, accounting, legal field, whatever. And I'm always shocked that uh, people have no clue and never heard the terms. Not that they don't have technical understanding, but what is singularity? What's Bitcoin? No clue. So, so tell me then out of curiosity, let's say you, you, you're hired to go and speak at, a, at an accounting conference, as you said. What do you tell those people who uh, just like us, live in their own bubble. 
what do you tell them to sort of pop it or connect the bubbles? So specifically with accounting, I'm trying to deliver tools they will need to survive because there is definitely a lot of automation coming their way. And uh, again, not knowing what blockchain technology is, what cryptocurrencies are, I'll speak to a group of maybe 200 executives, international executives from different accounting firms, and maybe one hand will go up. Uh, at the last conference, it was really awesome. So one hand goes up, the guy knows what Bitcoin is. And I'm like, that's wonderful. Who are you? How is it you know this? And he wasn't a CEO. He wasn't an executive. He was a T guy who bought Bitcoin to pay ransoms with. <laughs> he was the only one in that group of professionals who knew what's going to replace them. Wow. And to pay ransoms with, that means their system must have been hijacked by hackers. Not yet. He was smart enough to buy it early enough, and now it was his best investment, and he was like, I'm doing really well with my Bitcoin portfolio. Wow. Okay, good for him. <laughs> Very well. So, so then, if we are to just stick into our bubble, what are the sort of major developments, if there were any, since our last conversation for the past three years? So I think we can talk about kind of birth of AI safety as a respectable field. Back then it was more science fiction and a lot of crazy people. And now it's respectable. As you said, a lot of top names are uh, paying attention to it. There are conferences, there is funding, journals, special issues, books coming out. So it's definitely went from it doesn't exist to now there are multiple job opportunities. Students are getting PhDs in it. So that's that's the main difference in my opinion mm -hmm. yeah and i have to agree with that impression i just come back from full camp uh, in sebastopol in california organized by o'reilly media and there were probably 150 or so so-called thought leaders there um, and one thing that really amazed me was and everyone had this tag and you could uh, choose three separate keywords or phrases that describe your interests or what you do. And one thing that really, really, really impressed me was how many of them had two things that I thought were exceedingly rare before, and that was AI safety and AI ethics. Mm. Two things that you on the AI safety side have been talking about for a decade, and then me on the ethics side have been talking about for a decade. And now I go over there and there's so many people, AI ethics, AI safety, and I'm like, wow, isn't that something? It is, but it's just a different bubble. I'm sure if we went and looked at the names, they show up at every other conference. Every time I go, it's the same 20 keynote speakers, so we say hi, so it's wonderful, but it, it's not as big as the field of AI. If you think about AI development, making it more capable, you're talking at least 100,000 researchers, maybe a million people contributing a different way. Here you have, I don't know, 100 people, 10 of them working full time. So it, it's still not where I want it to be. It's still not supported financially the way it needs to be, whereas it, it needs to be an in, integrated part of the field. You can develop an AI system, if it's not safe or reliable, what did you just make? So if if there's that kind of sort of disproportionality that you're describing about, does that mean that what we need is a kind of an AI 9-11 type of an event before safety and perhaps even ethics become sort of a part of the design rather than a band-aid afterthought? I heard people argue that point. I hope it's not the case. I hope a lot of small examples will be sufficient. One of the things I'm working on is a collection of historical examples of how AIs fail. So, okay, Tesla kills a pedestrian. That's one data point. Microsoft chatbot goes crazy with... Uber car runs over a person in Arizona. Things like that. So hopefully this trend of them getting more frequent, almost exponential... Uh, level of increase in frequency and impact. Hopefully the trend itself is enough. We don't need to have something as bad as what you suggested. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, many people who have expressed the same opinion like you in terms of the dis disproportionality uh, disagree with both of us and say that it's not going to happen unless you have like a massive calamity. Because unfortunately, there's that point of view that humanity can only be mobilized by such powerful negative events. And until then, you sort of lack the collective will or focus or intention to, to do any of that kind of stuff. So I'm not saying it's not going to happen. It might very well. Um, 
the question is, is it going to be a natural occurrence or is someone going to kind of try to accelerate development? And I hope that's not the case. That would not be the right way to go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in a way, actually, you, you may even hope that it happens if it does happen, it happens sooner rather than later, because sooner it may be a smaller uh, event rather than later, because as we proceed in time, the capabilities increase and therefore the, the magnitude is likely to be even greater. All right. And of course, you'll get more time as a result. So it's beneficial in multiple ways. Right, right. So how about your own personal work? How has this progressed or changed or improved in the last three years since our conversation? So it's much easier now to get collaborators, to get uh, remote assistants, to recruit students. It's a lot easier to publish. There are actually multiple conferences, multiple journal special issues coming out on this topic. Definitely, if I need to go to a conference or I want to get invited to speak in my latest uh, work, that's all quite possible. I'm at the point where I turned down 90% of invites because it's just too much at this point. So I guess it's a great problem to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, I think, is a good sign in itself, isn't it? Well, it's definitely a sign of interest. I mean, usually those conferences are commercial to a certain degree. So if people are paying $1,000 to hear people like me speak about it, I mean, there is definitely some commitment to, to learning about this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. Now, uh, let's uh, switch our attention for a little while to your book. Now, so first of all, uh, let me show the book again. Uh, and again, this is sort of like the, the review manuscript, if you will. But I imagine the cover would be exactly the same, right? I hope so. Uh, we're still working on getting the hard copy to look right. They tried to, uh, I guess, uh, streamline the process. And so it ended up looking like blue screen of death. <laughs> but uh, I'm yelling at people as we speak. Uh, the soft cover is done right and the digital book is done right. Okay, because I wanted to ask you if there's any particular meaning behind this, because it's it's a kind of a cartoon with a number of elements, robots in a classroom. Uh, you even have uh, two books in a bookshelf here, or th uh, three books that you can see the title, the titles was uh, of. Of course, at the top shelf, we have your previous <laughs> book. Then we have Nick Wallstrom's book and so on. So is there any particular importance uh, of the, or, or a meaning behind this cover? All right. So first of all, I wanted a custom image. I didn't want to take a standard image, which everyone uses. I did it with the last book. And uh, if you remember this one, there was like five other books with uh, this theme. And so I wasn't happy with it. I had an idea in my mind exactly what I wanted, but I'm not an artist. So I was like, let me shop around and see if I can find someone to do it. I got a few quotes for like $7,000, $8,000. I was just thinking it's not going to happen. But then someone amazing stepped up and said, OK, I'll turn your vision into a visual uh, hundred words and a picture and it worked out beautifully very affordable quick delivery and people saying they love it you should judge this book by its cover it's beautiful so yeah definitely there is a lot of meaning in it in terms of what i wanted people to kind of get out of it it's robots learning from a human teacher that is bayesian statistics to discover there is also optical illusions they are looking at, so kind of reality of the world versus the sensory inputs. The books, of course, are there to integrate with a larger framework of what came before it, but there is also a few Easter eggs you should kind of study, and uh, there is solution inside the book. We described what the prompt was, but uh, I think it turned out well. Yeah, I agree completely. And I even wanted to raise a little bit of a question about the formula on the blackboard here. Is there s something about that that we should... So that's the base equation, right? That's the way to make decisions given new evidence you get and how to update your beliefs about the world. It's considered kind of like a gold standard of uh, decision making and learning about the reality. So that's, that's the meaning behind it. I assume, again, most readers will just see it as some sciencey thing but to those who are truly in the know it would be a nice little extra yeah that's why i thought i'd bring a little attention to it because i thought it was I, I thought first of all it works for me at least it works very well uh second of all it has a lot of deeper meaning and and easter eggs and, and sort of 
interesting sort of it, it it creates the engagement and the mystery and it invites you to open up the page i like it personally very much but then again i'm kind of like a geek so why not we'll see how it goes so far it's sold out on day one at amazon so we'll see if it continues mm -hmm. so it's selling out well so far uh, I mean, I don't know how many they get for initial release. I assume it's not millions, but uh, it sold out the day one. They're waiting to get more copies. It's available for sale, but you have to wait on delivery. The digital version is available right away. Fantastic. So what are the prices by any chance for anyone who is interested to get the book? Right. So the hard uh, copies, uh, hard cover version is very expensive. It's for library use. I wouldn't uh, buy it for individual use. The soft card version is at about $60 right now, and the digital one came out at 60 I predict it will go much lower, hopefully soon. $60 for the digital version? Yes, and that was not uh, what uh, we agreed on, and I'm yelling at multiple people to get it to under 30 my goodness, that's a lot for a digital version. 60 It should be a dollar, basically, but uh, that's not how publishing works. Wow, but in the digital version, you have like the infinite ability to copy and it's not an issue. I agree with you 100%. We need to fix the world. Wow, my goodness, $60. That's like, wow. If you feel bad giving me $60, I only get like a few pennies. So don't worry about it. You're donating to a good publisher. No, I, I know, I know. And I know your publisher too, and I agree with that. But And I know how it works and you get a tiny fraction of it all. And I know that it's not even up to you. It's like their decision, the pri pricing strategy is all their decision and all that. But I mean, I'm just thinking, what are they thinking? No, I think long term, it's going to be under 30 that's realistic and then you look at it it's about 500 pages most people would publish it as a four book anthology so i think per dollar number of pages you'll be okay with it it's not going to be insane mm -hmm. okay so putting the cover and the, the cost to the side um let's talk about who is this book for because the previous book that we discussed here in my podcast was kind of very sort of expert oriented and we even sort of compared and contrasted it a little bit with Nick Bostrom's book which came roughly a little bit maybe before that uh, and so is this book targeting the same audience or a different audience? So uh, as we talked about it's a limited number of people working in this area and interested in it so I, I was hoping to get something for everyone to at least get that crowd. The first half of a book is really for absolutely anyone interested in science, technology, future, just very general, easy to read, easy to understand. The second part is a bit of a mix. You get something very scientific, very specific for engineers, for scientists, can be used as a textbook for a course, but also you get uh, kind of opinion pieces, ethics pieces. I have representation from every conceivable angle, you know, philosophical papers, science, engineering, so on. So it's a large book. You don't have to read it cover to cover. I know most people don't have time to read 500 pages, basically. So you can skip around the chapters independent. I think for most people, about half of a book would be awesome, and the other half they can skip without losing generality. But many people, I know some who got early access, read the whole thing, and quite enjoyed it, the diversity of opinions and presentations. Yeah, I think, and, and you start uh, extremely well by grounding the beginning of the book with some classic texts, for example, like Bill Joyce, uh, famous or notorious, I may, might have to say, a piece on why the future doesn't need us, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, and it has 28 chapters, all written by different authors from different backgrounds and fields, as you describe. Uh, but I think the beginning is grounded in incredibly well, so it sort of sucks you right in and it tells you why you should care and why this whole thing is important. And then it proceeds with people like Ray Kurzweil, Steve Omohundro, Max Tegmark, Nick Bostrom, uh, most people that David Brin and so on that I've had on my podcast, except for Nick, whom I've been chasing for six years. And maybe next year, I was told, maybe next year, we'll see what happens. We'll push him, we'll push him. <laughs> so okay so is there because basically it's a diverse pieces of writing uh it's hard for the book to say a single thesis perhaps but is there an overarching theme or does it aggregate to something 
So maybe it's implicit. It's not an explicit theme, but this diversity of approaches and concerns is exactly the point. AI safety is not a single narrow problem. It's a concern about so many things. We can start with things we worry about today, technological unemployment, bias in algorithms, uh, adversarial examples already exist today, already a problem. But then we can look at future developments as technology becomes more capable. What are the values of those machines? How can we control them? Is it possible? So that's the whole point. It's large and diverse because you want to handle all of this. It's not enough to just address, okay, this algorithm is not biased against this particular group. We now have AI safety. That's not even close to how it works. You have to see it as a big picture, as this landscape of possible issues, and any permanent solution needs to address all of those. And maybe uh, you should get a feel for just how difficult the problem is from it, and maybe not uh, completely solvable in a true sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so that kind of follows the idea that we might not need a silver bullet, but silver buckshot. Uh, in other words, let a thousand flowers bloom kind of idea, uh, you know, and, and which is why I like this book very much. And I like your approach because uh, my whole goal with my work is to create a symposium, which kind of sets the whole possible spectrum of possibilities from the best to the worst to, to the thousands, uh, you know, possibilities within that. And your book does excellent job in laying all the possibilities, the the, the dangers, uh, the possibilities, the approaches uh, and the difference in the approaches to, to make uh, uh, value alignment as it's been called nowadays or AI safety and security uh, and so on and so on. Uh, so I, I highly recommend your book. Um, now, what uh, if any have been the developments in what you used to call leak proofing the singularity or creating, uh, as you call it in this book, safety and security of AI in the past three years since our last conversations? Do you see any progress in that specific field or any diverse approaches that give you the most hope and promise perhaps? So there has been a few extra publications kind of developing the theoretical framework more, but again, we don't have an actual super intelligent system to test with, so it's very hard to, to implement a practical solution you can verify. It seems to be the general pattern in this field where we develop a kind of patchwork of solutions, but nothing even in a subdomain is a complete solution. We can relax, this is no longer a problem. So. I don't know, we published two papers on how to shut off such systems. But it doesn't mean it's a universal off switch and you can work with it. And it's the same with everything. Okay, value alignment, we can get these two values to work well, but there is still so much more to it where it's still not quite done. And it seems to be this uh, fractal nature of a problem. As you realize this is an issue, here's a solution, then the solution itself opens up 10 new problems. Okay, let's zoom in on that. The process continues. So you always discover more problems and never close doors on problems whatsoever. It's always, it, it's getting more challenging. We realize, oh, we never considered this as an option. Okay, what if we look at that? And uh, so far, that's been the pattern. We're discovering the size of the field, breadth of it, but there is no final solutions at this point. Right, and so you have sort of the, the optimists and, and the pessimist, and my opinion is kind of like somewhere there. Um, but uh, so so you have the optimists who think that eventually we we ought to find like, uh, what, what was Tivo Mohundra's term? Provable safe uh, frameworks uh, or something like that, that he called it. Mathematically provable safe frameworks within which we can sort of develop those AI algorithms. But then there's others who say, that you know, value alignment, perfect value alignment is 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 always going to be impossible to accomplish. Uh, my my own personal take is somewhere like my view is kind of like the way I view children. Uh, I mean, you could and you should try to do the best to give the best possible start and upbringing and and role models for your kids, 
But it's the nature of intelligence that you can never guarantee how they're going to turn out. So you can give them the best of everything and they can still turn out to be, you know, a Charles Mason or an Adolf Hitler or something horrible like that. Even though you diminish the probability with giving them love and care and education, there's still the possibility remaining. Whereabouts do you align yourself on that spec? So that's my latest research, figuring out if this problem is even solvable. So with regards to mathematical proofs, I did work on unverifiability, showing that in a perfect sense, we can never fully verify any mathematical proof. We can get it uh, closer and closer, depending on the amount of resources we spend to this uh, perfect 100% reliability, but we never get there. And it's the same with safety. The capabilities of the system and how controllable it is are inversely related. The more system is capable, the less controllable it is. And so, yeah, basically, I think the term safe AI is not accurate. We can talk about safer AI. If we add a lot more resources for a few more billion dollars, I can make it another 2% safer, but I never get to 100%. And concern is, this is good enough for cybersecurity, this is good enough for narrow AI. With AGI, with super intelligence, you cannot have a system which fails one out of every billion decisions. It's just not acceptable. So that's where I stand right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, uh, you start your book here in sort of the preface with a prediction and you say, I predict that both the frequency and seriousness of such events, and you talk about sort of negative possibilities, uh, even small ones like, you know, the, the accidents of self-driving cars and upwards from there. Uh, and so you say, I predict that the, both the frequency and the seriousness of such events will steadily increase as AI, AIs become more capable. Um, the failures of today's narrow domain AI are just a warning. Once we develop artificial general intelligence, AGI, capable of cross-domain performance, hurt feelings will be the least of our concerns. <laughs> right, so I talk about uh, Tay Chatbot from Microsoft as an example of failure and people kind of freaked out, but damage was very limited from that, whereas if you have a system responsible for significant infrastructure, it's a very different animal. Right, but, but we are developing more and more systems that are uh, controlled by AI from, you know, air traffic control to, to y you name it. Uh, everything, really everything, yeah. There is, it's harder to find something we no longer control with software and complexity is such you can't just take over manually. It's just too complex for a single person to handle. So what is the probability of having what I refer to as sometimes failing gracefully so uh, and let me give you a personal context which is outside of your domain a little but very close to computer science so i i use wordpress to run my uh, blogging platform and i have this one plugin for social media shares and when they release the latest update of the plugin it's not that the plugin stopped working but it even crashed my web freaking website and i got incensed by this and i told them guys look it's one thing for the plugin to crash, which means that people are not going to be able to use the plugin to share on Twitter. That's annoying, but it's not the end of the world. But if you release an update which crashes my website, that's ungracefully failing. That's like failing beyond the, the limits of, of failure that all in all reasonable sort of uh, programming and engineering, you should contain the damage within. <laughs> So what is the chance of us to have graceful failures within such systems? Well, I think you answered your own question. We can't even get it to work for your website. We just talked about Skype where it's not able to recognize my microphone. I had to have you call me because I can't make outside calls. Like if we can't handle this narrow domain, trivial, well-developed for dozens of years technology, how can we possibly deal with something of complexity where it exceeds our capability? Right, just to fill in uh, our uh, viewers and listeners uh, on our conversation before we began today. Uh, basically, uh, you had trouble uh, calling me because uh, if I call you, your microphone works. But if you call me, your microphone doesn't work. And it's a brand new, very high-end uh, microphone, very high quality. Um, and, and I even added that uh, I give sometimes as an example Skype uh, uh, as an example of technological regress rather than progress. <laughs> so, um, so, but any update from Microsoft can be considered that. 
Right. And so, for example, I had scheduled an interview a couple of weeks ago with Dr. Uh, uh, Gregor from nutritionfacts.org to talk about uh, how not to age uh, and nutrition promoting uh, life extension and stuff like that. And right when I was logging into Skype, Microsoft updated the Skype software and instantaneously my recording software got screwed up and I wasn't able to record anymore. And I booked this interview six months ago and now I have to wait for another two months, not to mention the embarrassment and the fact that I look like totally unprofessional idiot who, uh, you know, was not prepared to properly. It, it happens a lot. It happens a lot exactly that way. It updates the, at the worst possible moment. So uh, again, there's a great narrow examples of what we can expect as capability increases. So what's that say about the whole AI thing then and, and, and our chance and, and w w would that would that not make us all pessimists and skeptics and cynics then? Be realistic. So I think having a negative bias or positive bias is not helpful. Look realistically at technology. Do we have any software which is bug-free, unhackable, reliable? Answer that question and then scale it to the complexity of software you want to develop. Mm -hmm. And then we even have another issue here, which by the way, the danger as, as I see it, at least initially for, for let's say the short to medium term future doesn't come from AGI, but comes and you, you talk uh, on the very, uh, in the very forward about that. It comes from uh, basically deliberate, unethical, uh, sort of malicious actions uh, guided by humans. Can you talk a little bit about that? Right. So almost everyone in AI safety concentrated on accidents. So we fail to design software properly. We fail to implement it. There are bugs in the code. It's misaligned with what we intended. But they completely ignored this possibility of the same people who now write viruses and malware using AI out of the box, just add their own goals and using it for very uh, negative purposes. So it could be crazy people, terrorists, whoever, foreign governments. And there is absolutely nothing against that. At the time when we published our paper on malevolent AI, uh, it went viral, but there was nothing else to, to talk about. Since then, there was a workshop with it. A big report came out about kind of narrow tools used for... Um, uh, bypassing cybersecurity and things like that. But still, to this day, there is two not peer-reviewed publications on this whole topic, which seems to be strictly worse. Every time you do this malevolent design, you still can screw up, you still can have mistakes in the code, so you still get all the other problems. But now you have this additional malevolent payload, and there is nothing you can do about people taking your well-designed software and hacking it and modifying it in a exact opposite direction. Instead of curing cancer, now it's spreading cancer. It's quite trivial once you have access to the code. So this seems like the worst problem with zero ideas for addressing it. Uh, there is insider threat as well. So to me, this is uh, like a very clean, easy way to prove to people they should be concerned. A lot of times I'll talk to someone and they'll be like, We'll never develop human level intelligence. We'll never do this. This will never happen. But if I reply by saying, I will do it, I'll do it on purpose, that immediately wins the point. There is nothing they can say. Well, if you do it, then yeah, it's going to happen. But there are thousands of crazy people out there. Right. And we know there are people today who would kill us all if they could do that. And and by the way, they would kill themselves included too. They'll bring the, about the end of the world for, for ideological, religious or other reasons. Uh, for example, if they could put their hands on nuclear weapons and so on. But actually it may turn out to be, and we know that uh, weapons of mass destruction um, uh, get easier uh, to access and to produce when we go down the, the list from nuclear to biological to chemical and maybe AI would be sort of the democratizing WMD uh, sort of uh, factor which would make it very cheap, very easy and, and easy to manipulate uh, uh, and, and accessible. And very hard to control because you no longer have to control resources of a country or a corporation. You have to get to the level of a teenager in a garage with a laptop. How do you control that? Right, because you don't have to create it. You All you need to do is just to modify the, the utility function or something like that. Right. So instead of save people's lives, 
kill people. <laughs> exactly. So, so everything else you can leave untouched except for the utility function, and then it goes down the hill from there. And it's an Achilles heel for any safety mechanism. So let's say you propose a good, reliable safety mechanism. If I can turn it off, if someone else can disable it, it's not a working solution. It's also possible certain actually good intention safety mechanisms create backdoors into the system. So if you make a system very corrigible to make it possible to make changes to it, now the bad guys can come in and modify it in unpredictable ways. Right, right. So we're we're in a double bind here, and, and I, as I often say, you know, I'm I'm not w worried about uh, you know uh, artificial intelligence, but I'm really worried about human stupidity because uh, Albert Einstein said there are two infinite things in the in the universe. One is the universe, and the other is human stupidity. And I'm not so sure about the universe. We just published a paper on artificial stupidity. I think it's relevant. So the idea of formalizing human stupidity and teaching machines about it, both to pretend to be humans for passing Turing tests and to make them more limited so we can better control them. So it's not a joke paper, it's a real tool. That's fantastic. Uh, how can we find or how can I link to that paper? It just came out an archive, so I can send you a link right after and uh, you'll have it. Okay, perfect. And now add the link to the show notes. Fantastic. Excellent. I wish I had read it in advance to prepare for this, but Archive delayed publishing it by three weeks again for similar reasons we discussed. I think they couldn't get LaTeX to work. Wow. Oh, okay. Wow. And then imagine if we have to actually respond. I mean, so let's say we have some kind of an AI safety emergency. How do we respond? And are there any mechanisms at all, uh, whether corporate or national or international, uh, you're the expert in the field. I'm totally clueless. What? What? Can, let's say we have a rogue AI originating from it doesn't matter Russia, China, even the US. It's it's equally possible. I think. What happens next? Who is it? Whose job is it to go do something about it? So let's not even talk about AI. Let's just talk about software today. Whatever it's a computer virus quickly spreading, or there is a hack on uh, some platform. What is the response? Well, there is no response. You'll get an email telling you to change your social security number. That's the solution. Can you even change your social security number? Not an easy way. It's like it's, it's a complex process. You can renew your credit cards, whatever. But the point is, no, there is nothing. Maybe you can be part of some lawsuit and 10 years later get $3 to compensate. But there is no response team for something like that. So basically, we are totally unprepared. We're like... So if you have an earthquake or if you have a flood or if you have a hurricane, you have a certain, whether it's FEMA or somebody else like the National Guard, you know, the, the, the fire department, you name it, someone, uh, it, it falls within somebody's jurisdiction to come, you know, save your life, pull you out of the rubble or something like that. But when it comes to uh, even just basic software, let alone AI, uh, we got nothing. We've got nothing and it's worse because all the response teams, all the communications, everything is digital and controlled by software. So if the problem is with infrastructure, this digital framework, then you can't even call for help really. I mean, your digital phone will not work. Your GPS system to get you to the accident site will not work. So it's actually much worse in this scenario. What if I send smoke signals? Uh, good luck with that. It's probably <laughs> your digital cigarette will not work properly. It's connected to internet and will not connect at the right time. <laughs> My goodness. I mean, the, the the First Nations, we call them First Nations in Canada, the, the Aboriginals in Australia, I think in, in, in the US you call them Indians. Uh, but, but the original... Native people, Americans. Native Americans, that's right. Okay. Uh, those people had many things right, I think. <laughs> so... Uh, okay, that was a terrible way to put it, by the way. So I should be smarter and careful when I make statements like that. And I, I apologize if, if I screw that one tremendously. Uh, let's go back to a topic where I can make a little better statements, perhaps. So, yeah, and, and you finish that statement just to finish that previous thought that we've been uh, talking about so far by saying that, quote, the most dangerous type of AI and the one of the most difficult uh, to defend against is an AI made malevolent on purpose, which is basically what we were talking all about. So let me see here <clears throat> if I can go 
to the conclusions of the of the forward and see if I think if I can get something interesting to to discuss here. So you say, quote, numerous recent advancements in all aspects of research, development, and deployment of intelligence systems are well publicized. By safety and security issues related to AI are rarely addressed. The book you're reading aims to mitigate this fundamental problem as a first multi-author volume on this subject, which I hope will be seen as humankind's communal response to the control problem, end of quote. So it's our collective response in a book, but yet, so that's kind of still sort of like very academic in a way, right? Until there's like a task force, like an AI, should there be like an AI task force or or a global AI security force or or something of that source which because let's 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 face it the the more we go forth in time the 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 higher the probability something would go wrong like i'd be shocked if if eventually we don't have some kind of 911 type of event with ai's involvement and and again the the goal may not originate within the ai it may be malevolently programmed by a human actor or it may be just a a byproduct by by sort of misalignment of, of the programming goal and the sort of the the understanding of the machine or the AI as as it sees it from his programming point of view, right? And then should we have some kind of a task force for that? So there is already a lot of work and trying to figure out if that's a thing we should have and how to do it and how to get governments involved and corporations. So at many levels, there is partnerships on AI, there is UN task force, AI for good, there is uh, probably too many at this point organizations all trying to get uh, as many partners as they can, everyone on board, to figure out how to do governance of AI. Can we legally control it? There is now papers published on things like legal personhood for AIs, where using existing corporate personhood, you can give personhood to systems, software. Today, not even futuristic. So you have this dumb software with all the privileges of a citizen. Sophia got citizenship in Saudi Arabia or something like that. The robot. Yes, Sophia robot. I think it was more of a marketing publicity thing. I don't think it's meaningful. But legal uh, personhood is possible already in multiple Western countries. So that's something to consider. Um, the research is taking place. We have a special issue of a journal coming up on governance of AI. We had competition just recently with a good AI company sponsoring a few awards for that. But it's basically where AI safety was maybe five years ago. It's just now people are kind of waking up to it and political scientists, lawyers are coming on board and going, oh, I can contribute with this. I'm not a machine learning guy, but I understand legal framework. I can help you with smart contracts. I can help you with how to explain to politicians what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And you yourself uh, went and were present at the Asilomar conference uh, on beneficial AI. Yes. Organized by uh, the Future of Humanity Institute. Future of Life Institute. Future of Life Institute, sorry. I need more distinct names. We're running out of future something. Right, I'm getting it all messed up because there's, as you said, so many of them and it's it's a little bit tricky. And some of them changed their names too, like Singularity Institute became Machine Intelligence Research Institute and then it's like, anyway, I'm just only human. So if you're a machine intelligence, you'd never make that mistake, but there we go. Uh, so what's your impression when you went there... Uh, is there any tangible benefit? Are we making progress? What was sort of the 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 the, the thing that you took away from that? Because that was about a year ago, right? Uh, about almost two years now, but yeah, close to that. So uh, I think the goal was to get really the top people from very different fields. So human rights, philosophy, mathematics, and get very diverse opinion on this problem. So, so far we had kind of computer scientists talk about it, maybe a few outliers. But the goal was to expand this conversation and, again, give uh, respectability to it. If you have Nobel Prize winners there, you know, contributing to this discussion, that kind of makes it sound like an important, important problem. And I think it definitely, for me at least, it was uh, good to see the quality of people who are concerned with this problem. Mm -hmm. And then, so, so that's kind of like public perception, PR, getting the minds together, okay. And what about the idea of like, other than sort of open letters and getting 
you know, 10,000 people to sign behind something, which, you know, actually does seem to make a difference because look at what happened with Google. Uh, they had this this targeting software contract for $250 million or something like that, I think, with the Pentagon. And then a number of engineers rebelled against it and to the point where, and it seems it was much more of a struggle behind the scenes for a longer time and, and where people resigned and all kinds of things happened uh, before Google actually took the decision to eventually, you know, um, uh, get out of that uh, commitment in that contract and refuse any such future ones. All right. So that's just one outcome. There was also the actual principles developed, which is sort of guiding framework for doing research in the future. There was uh, some funding distributed to very senior scholars to spend maybe a little less time developing more capable systems and shift some of that time to developing safer system, which is, again, good for good for the field. Uh, I definitely see a lot of potential from such events. I suspect it's going to happen again in the future. Uh, just uh, networking and getting opportunities to collaborate uh, really, really useful. Yeah, I think that's that's very important because people face-to-face uh, -face time is always very valuable. And full camp that I went to right now was, was another great example of that. But uh, another spillover positive effect, at least in my books, connected with my values is, for example, a similar case when it happened with immigration. So there were all those uh, software engineers and others in Microsoft who rebelled against uh, their software and, and Microsoft software being used uh, to, to sort of classify uh, immigrants and sort of uh, use that software uh, by the U.S. immigration in the process of separating parents from their children and, and all of that. Because the way they saw it, and of course, the way I see it, that's, it's, it's highly unethical to, to separate uh, children from their parents. Uh, so so it, it has that positive uh, sort of example. And, and once you have that example, then other people start asking questions. And maybe it's not AI, but it's something else that they find unethical. And of course, that's a double-edged sword. But but uh, I think it's, it's important to have those role models. Well, what about the idea that... Uh, since humanity seems to have so much power within this process, at least initially, and I, I always like to say that at least until we have artificial general intelligence, technology in general and artificial intelligence in particular is merely a magnifying mirror of humanity because it captures sort of our hopes and dreams and our fears, the best and the worst of us, the good and our good and our evil. And it doesn't have an essence of its own, but merely takes the essence that we give it, but it mag magnifies it then. It makes it so much more powerful. So one way of trying to improve it is to not just look at the mirror and trying to fix the mirror, but rather try to fix the image that we start with, that we project uh, within that mirror. Is that sort of like a very romantic, from your point of view as an expert, as, as an engineer and security expert, is that not some kind of a sort of like a, a very romantic, naive, conception of like some kind of a philosopher kind of guy well, i think it's meaningful when we talk about value alignment what are we aligning with do we agree on human values can we get five people to agree on anything usually not and philosophers have been trying to develop common moral ethical framework for millennia and obviously failed completely so i think it points out to we are not safe if you just had a system value aligned to an average person or a specific person, it would be horribly unsafe. I wouldn't want that system. So our best proposal for solution right now is to model this future system and existing unsafe systems and hope it's going to work out. So I agree with you. What we have today is just tools which kind of amplify our capability to do whatever we want to do. But in the future, we'll have agents with independent ability to make decisions. And if they are modeled on the example we have as ourselves as average of humanity, we're in trouble for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what about the idea that stupid AI is more dangerous than smart AI? So this is again to the paper on artificial stupidity. We actually argue uh, stupid in this sense means at the level not to exceed human beings. So it has the same amount of memory, same processing speed, Basically, any human limitations, cognitive biases are analyzed, formalized, and built into the system. So now you have competitive 
uh, possibility. It's no longer super intelligent, super capable. It's limited. I think there is benefit to limiting capacity of certain devices. I don't want my toaster to be smarter than me and take over the universe. I want it to be smart enough to know it's a Saturday, I wake up, I like my toast a certain way, it's ready when I get there. So it shouldn't be smarter than a you know IQ of 80 or something like to get there. Whereas uh, for other systems, it's a scientist, it has to be smarter than average person. So you can figure out just the necessary amount of IQ intelligence as a computational resource to give to different devices. I think it's an interesting tool to explore. Right. One of the, the ways I like to start some of my keynote speech is just to sort of shock you know, people who are not familiar with it and, and, and start kind of in an unconventional way is I start with the question, what happens when your toothbrush is smarter than you? And then people think, oh, that's a totally ridiculous, crazy question. And then I, I start actually showing the history and the development and the trends. And I, I start actually showing and, and by 20 minutes in, people are like, oh, oh, you know, darn, my toothbrush might actually one day be smarter than me. Then what? Absolutely. Right? It may be cheaper to produce a single pre-computed chip with all the intelligence than to customize it. So people go with cheaper, more efficient option. And yeah, everything is smarter than you. Uh, it's not... So, for example, when we had our car, uh, we had the, the uh, so my, my wife uh, got like a, she's like a regional vice president for a company called Arbon, and one of the perks there is they give you uh, a free Mercedes. And so at the time, uh, the only condition is that it's white. And so at the time was a 350 and a 300, Mercedes C350 and 300. And what was different was that uh, they both have the same six-cylinder engine, but one is 300 horsepower and the other was 230. And, and what was crazy about it was that actually all the engines were the same built to 303 horsepower, six cylinders. And then the cheaper model, the engine was detuned down to 230 because it was cheaper for them to produce the better, more powerful engine and then just turn off some options so that you can't use all the power. And if you want the more power, you just pay more for it, but you get the same piece of hardware actually. Right, that's exactly what the situation is. And I think it's a design mistake to put excessive intelligence into devices which don't require it, both because it now makes them less safe from their point of view, but also it makes them less uh, safe from hackers, external people getting resource to this device. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what do you think of this? You know, I was supposed actually to interview Professor Stuart Russell uh, uh, last week, who together with uh, Peter Norwick is, uh, of course, uh, the co-author of the most popular sort of best-selling uh, textbook on AI across the globe. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he canceled and we had to reschedule for September. So uh, I hope to get him in September. But, you know, I was preparing for his interview for a while. And one of the pr uh, proposals that he has is, and he has sort of like three ideas or three principles to make AI safety. And the, the second one is that uh, the AI has to acknowledge ignorance. Uh, she has to acknowledge that it's ignorant uh, and, and that's a way of making it safe. So, uh, so it would have to acknowledge that, uh, let's say, for example, if I say to the AI, go get me a cup of coffee, uh, let's say I say something like, I'd kill for a coffee, <laughs> right? Or I'd die for a coffee, right? Uh, the AI should be smart enough first to figure out that it shouldn't take it literally. So it shouldn't just go and kill everybody in Starbucks, like on the line and, and like steal a coffee and bring it to me because I said I'd kill for a coffee, right? But also it, it has to understand that if I notice that the AI is doing something wrong, the robot is doing something wrong, it would have to acknowledge the possibility it may be ignorant and therefore allow to be uh, turned off by me as a way of ensuring itself its safety. How, what do you think of this kind of solution to the problem that he proposes? So uh, it sounds like it's uh, useful while the system is in training stages, right? It's learning about the values, it's not sure, and it's perfectly reasonable at that stage in some controlled environment and this additional goal of corrigibility, I can turn you off, I can change your uh, internal settings, it is very reasonable. Uh, again, does it open it up uh, to other people who say, well, no, I'm certain, go kill Nicola. <laughs> okay, well, I have to listen to humans, they're smarter, 
And also, once it actually finishes this training process and it's like, I'm kind of confident I know what I'm doing. Is it now exactly the same problem we started with? Anytime it faces a new situation, it's still uh, not uh, using human common sense. So it's uh, approach kind of, I think, similar to what we do with artificial stupidity, just kind of mm, being stupid about goals and values, not about capabilities. It's complementary, I think, but uh, it's probably not a permanent solution for very capable systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And he talks about the fact that there has to be a certain kind of spectrum or realm where too much certainty is detrimental too little too little certainly is useless so you have this kind of a sweet spot where it's not a hundred percent certain which means that it's going to be willing to get the the utility curve or, or the goal at any cost but it's certain enough so that it's useful for practical applications and that's the tricky part like well, that's kind of what we do with people, right? We don't want psychopaths who like one idea, I'll get there, I need to do it for my religion, profit, whatever. So you want this reasonable, not extreme values in uh, fitness function. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if you were to sort of have a conversation with Stuart Russell yourself, what is the perhaps one or two kind of key questions you'd like to ask him yourself? So I had conversations with Stuart, and uh, I think the one he still hasn't uh, answered specifically, he thinks we can have a mathematical proof of safety. Right. Just like Stephen Omohundro argues, yeah. Right. But uh, I have a paper showing that, no, you can't have absolutely safe uh, mathematical proofs. And uh, I think there are others. I think Stuart Armstrong has a very similar paper. So... He never directly replied to that. He said uh, some things that we will be able to do it, but I would love to uh, get a formal a formal proof of possibility of a proof. Mm. Okay, I'll push him on that then. Let's see how he, <laughs> how he responds to that one. I, and I'll blame it on you. I'll tell him Professor Jampolski said that he spoke to you and, and he's still yet to hear about how you solved that. I'm sure I'll see him at some conference pretty soon and I'll uh, bring it up. Yeah. Well, maybe he'll bring it up. He'll say, you set me up for that interview with that podcaster guy. Yeah. Be, be gentle. Yeah, I'll, I'll do my best. I'll do my best. So, you know, one other thing that really worries me is, is again, humans, but in a, in a little bit of a different context. So let's say, or before I say that, let me, let me ask you first, has your timeline to AGI changed since our last conversation? Not, not really. I mean, it's all kind of guesswork with timelines, so I haven't seen uh, anything. There seems to be a trend with people who have insider knowledge to think it's gonna happen sooner. So you can update based on that. But I personally think still like 2045 is a reasonable guess. Cause I've had people tell me, look, we didn't think that uh, we'll defeat uh, uh, human players in Go for another decade, maybe two decades. And look, it happened like a year and a half ago, right? Uh, so it could in entirely happen likewise with, with AGI. And then there's this even further idea, I think it's Nick Bostrom's idea called a hardware overhang, which means that if we happen to figure out the software issues, we have so much capable hardware that if we have some kind of a super efficient uh, algorithm or software that runs on that, then suddenly everything can become AI, uh, AGI capable. It's possible. Uh, I would not be completely surprised if 10 years later we got there. But I don't think it changes anything in terms of what I'm doing or what I want others to do. It's still a very important problem. Work on it as soon as you can. So uh, I don't think I can work 80 hours a day instead of you know 24 a day. I'm still limited the same way. Right, right. So, so my further concern is that if we assume that the timeline hasn't changed, because I myself sort of like I'm about that I lean towards that way. I haven't seen anything. Plus, you know, th that would be sort of like a black swan event if something like that happened. And we can't really prepare really for black swan events. But let's say the, sort of in the longer term, medium to longer term, we expect AGI in the 2040s or something like that. But what worries me in the short to medium term is 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 humans who are out of work. Uh, what worries me is that that would be so disruptive to 
the social, the political, the economic system that we live in, that it kind of can create literally violent uprisings or revolution to the point where we self-destruct, not because that the AI came to destroy us, but we kind of destroy ourselves. So for example, uh, I think in like 30 states of the United States, the most popular uh, common job is, is a truck driver. And, and we know those jobs are, you know, they're sort of like a high-end blue collar jobs because uh, people used to, to make and still very hard, but, but, but make, you know, reasonable amount of money doing that, even though they work crazy hours and it's very tough on them and all that. And then suddenly, you know, we already are almost there and in another three or four, let alone five years, we would have all the technological know-how to basically make those people obsolete. Now, as Yuval Harari has pointed out, you know, those people are unlikely to become computer designers or graphic designers or, or you know, Bitcoin, you know, designers or, or programmers or who knows what, right? And even if they, they were, like, there's a question about what kind of graphic designers they would make. But what do we do? And is that a problem in the first place? Because in my books, this will be a political issue. Like having just, just in the United States, 5 million people making a living with driving something, truck or a car or, you know, a, a delivery vehicle of some car, that's a political issue. And once those people, and you combine that with the idea that in the United States, we say, if you don't work, you don't deserve to eat because only the lazy bums are the ones who uh, don't work. And the idea that it's a choice, uh, then aren't we set up for some kind of a violent upheaval, you know, especially in the context of so many guns and political polarization to begin with? So the good news is it's a problem, but it's solvable. It's a question of us deciding that we, we want to allocate money for people who lost their jobs, maybe from taxing this new technology. Here, we're done. You just have to do it. So it's not as bad as AI safety where we don't know what the solution is. Maybe there is no solution. So to me, it's a much, much less challenging problem. Like many problems, it's a question of just having political will. So we can have a conditional basic income. It's quite possible. Uh, today, in U.S. at least, we have lowest unemployment numbers we ever had or something close to that. So I don't think we're quite critical yet. We still have a few good months, years. Yeah, but it's uh, the, the numbers are not exactly accurate there because, yes, the lowest unemployment, but most of those jobs uh, are sort of like... Uh, part-time uh, jobs in the service industries, most of them, uh, you know, many people have two or three of those. Uh, most of them, even with sort of like the presence of smart scheduling uh, software, keeps people under 29 hours of work week, which means that they get no benefits. And it's designed exactly uh, for profit maximization to schedule people and and it doesn't ever make mistakes, right? So, for example, when I was in college, I used to work as a security guard and I really loved overtime because, you know, double and triple, uh, especially if it's like a holiday and, and when you're a poor student, that's how the best way I... And I always begged, can I have some overtime? And I always liked, you know, to do 50 or 60 hours a week and do New Year's and Christmas and what have you just to make, you know, a little more money. But when you have smart software like that, it basically makes sure that no one gets over 29 hours or whatever. Therefore, no one gets overpaid. Therefore, no one gets uh, benefits like medical insurance and stuff like that. And therefore, the numbers, low as they may be, do not accurately represent the, the sort of economic health of the populace, maybe of the economy as a whole, but not of the populace. I agree. There is definitely a lot of terrible, low-paying jobs. But as you said yourself, many people have two and three jobs. So again, that kind of speaks against this, we're losing all the jobs. If you have three of them, you can give up uh, one and still you have two jobs and you're not working 80 hours, you're down to 65, you're happy. Most of those jobs are so terrible, people are happy to lose them. Me and you, we love what we do, we would do it for free. Don't 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 tell anyone. But uh, this well, everybody about, knows about me, so I do it for free. I keep it a secret still. But uh, there are so many jobs. You know, the guy taking a receipt when you go through the parking lot. Like they they want to lose those jobs. They'll be very happy to get unconditional thousand dollars shipped to them a month from a machine which now takes that receipt, and they're going to be happiest ever. So 
I don't think it's as uh, horrible yet. Do I think long term all jobs will be automated? Physical labor, cognitive labor, absolutely, including my job. But uh, I think uh, that's a lot more solvable than the safety concerns. Some. I agree completely. It is solvable, but but if you look at uh, things like, for example, climate change, it's it's solvable. It's human caused. We know the science behind it is incontroversial. We know the steps we need to do, and yet we're not doing it. And that's exactly my point. So I'm less concerned about climate change than I am about something we don't have a solution for. Because, okay, it's getting really hot. We can't just call it redistribution of good weather or whatever. We have to react to it. So then you pass the law, it's maybe slightly too late, but you fixed it. Like an emergency, like 9-11 you brought up. Whereas if tomorrow I realize it's 9-11 with AI, there is still nothing I can do. I don't have a political solution. Right. Well... Yeah, and I am not sure even if 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 we come up with the law after the fact because you know the 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 Earth system is is very sort of complicated and once it gets out of equilibrium, then it's pushed towards a new equilibrium, and the new equilibrium may be like a few degrees warmer, and that could have tremendous impact. And and, and after that, it takes even more effort to bring back the equilibrium if that's possible at all. I agree with you completely on your concerns. I'm just trying to classify all problems into two groups. Those we just don't care enough about to do something and those we couldn't solve if we cared to an extreme maximum value. And I think there is a substantial fundamental difference. One is like a uh, kind of sexy problem people like science fiction and so it's very different from those mundane problems where, okay, I'll start recycling and I won't eat animals, now we're done. Right. <laughs> Okay, let's go back to the narrow AI dangers because um, another thing that people have pointed out that you know uh, you said human level or below human level, but but very much below human level could be dangers coming from algorithms like, for example, at click uh, ut utilization or maximization. Take, for example, YouTube or Facebook or something like that. And there, there, I was reading a bunch of work that says, you know, uh, you spend so much time on YouTube and then eventually uh, if you watch such and such video, you end up watching, you know, one of the flat earth videos or, uh, or, 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 or beheading video from ISIS or, or something because that's the way the algorithm was designed to progressively hook you up more and more and more. And so it's a very dumb thing designed just to to keep your engagement for as long as possible uh, and attention, but it produces uh, sideways effects. Like, for example, uh, Flat Earth's uh, website can peak at the first result on Google uh, simply because uh, you have like 5 million Twitter bots that, that you launch and everyone's linking to that website. And then when you go search for in Google, boom, it comes up as the first result, regardless of how truthful it is, right? It's like completely ridiculous statement, and yet it's the most popular result, therefore Google serves, it serves it first, regardless of its factual accuracy. And that's the danger. So, and the byproduct of that is allegedly Brexit, allegedly Trump uh, and uh, being elected and, and, and so on and so on. Well, I'm not sure it's a good idea to hide bad ideas and bad theories. When you train a neural network, you give it positive examples and negative examples. When we train students, we only give them positive examples. So they never seen pseudoscience. They never seen bad theories. Flat Earth is really bad theory. Like, <laughs> terrible. It's a perfect example. It should be taught as, okay, this is why it doesn't work. This is, okay, look at this, look at that. This is beautiful. Whereas we try to protect people from it. Think about how much data, which is not factually accurate, is the first result. Then I search something like, is God real? What am I going to get? Some church? Okay, we're fine with that. We know that this is this dream world, this is this world. It's perfectly fine. People need to have vaccines against bad diseases. Flat Earth is like this shot you get and then all the crazy ideas don't stick to you. You go, oh, it's the same guy who is selling Flat Earth. So I'm less concerned about this. I think people, especially adults, maybe children are different. Adults should be exposed to stupid, crazy ideas so they see the difference. Mm -hmm. But but then you end up with people who live in their own bubbles and then there was the guy who went in Washington, D.C. pizza shop because 
uh, Hillary Clinton was running a child uh, porn abduction ring in that pizza shop. <laughs> so sounds like this guy was not vaccinated against bad ideas. He saw an idea and he went, this is as good as anything I ever seen before. Yeah. I think CIA had uh, kind of experiments with American soldiers where to prevent them from getting propaganda from the enemies. They kind of gave them weak versions of the arguments. And later on, they were less likely to go, oh, communism sounds great. Let's do it. Yeah, I think actually Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, was participating in, the, in those psychop uh, experiments uh, when he was an undergrad. They did something to him, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, what's your take on the work by the Future of Humanity Institute, uh, or not Future of Humanity, Future of Life Institute, again, there we go again, uh, uh, by Max Tegmark and, and Nick Bostrom, and uh, they got about a $10 million grant from Elon Musk, of course, and so on. So Nick Bostrom is Future of Humanity, Max Tegmark, Future of Life. The grant was to Future of Life, and they redistributed to a large group of people. I was part of the first uh, cohort. I didn't get the second level this time. Uh, sounds wonderful. I mean, I'm happy they doing so much uh, service logistical work to support it, to promote it. It's great. I got both of them in a the book. Um, very happy. Yeah, fantastic. Okay. And then just so that we hopefully clarify, uh, clarify a little a technical issue here, uh, there seems to be a lot of misunderstanding uh, generally, but this, even in perhaps my audience, on the differences between what is machine learning in general and what is deep learning. Can you tell us what, what that is? So those labels, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, they all kind of very fuzzy. People use them interchangeably. A lot of times when you talk about uh, deep learning, you're talking about number of layers in a neural network. So the more layers, the deeper it gets. Machine learning is just any ways of teaching machines to uh, kind of learn like humans do or in a different, more efficient way. But because neural networks is such a dominant approach to doing it, reinforcement learning, those terms are now kind of used uh, under that umbrella. So when I say I'm doing machine learning, probably I'm training some neural network, it's probably deep and I'm probably reinforce uh, rewarding it. So that's just what it represents. Whereas all of it before used to be called artificial intelligence, but that was not very successful. So uh, certain people said, let's call it artificial general intelligence, what we truly mean when we want AI. But uh, it, it, those are not well-defined terms, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. and, and then it occurs to me, in the previous, I don't remember if it was in the original first conversation maybe, which was maybe four or five years ago, or it was in the second, which was three years ago, uh, you were saying how great of a fan of brute force you are. So the question then is, uh, how have or have they at all uh, machine learning and deep learning changed your views of, of brute force, especially in the context of breakthroughs like, uh, for example, uh, AlphaGo and so on? No, I think they confirmed what I said. It's through brute force where we get all of it. We have big data. We have thousands of processors crunching thousands of years of computation overnight. So that's how we got all the success. If we had same neural network training without all this massive computation, you know, 20 years ago, it would get nowhere. So we always had those awesome algorithms. If you look at, you know, convolution nets and now what, 20 years old, something like that, they didn't work at the time of invention because we didn't have brute force. And now we do and it works beautifully. I'm very happy being uh, validated on that. But isn't it like that machine learning and deep learning in particular are a little bit more, a little bit kind of even more of a shortcut than brute force, which is why people who were using brute force were predicting a decade or two, and yet with this kind of machine learning slash deep learning shortcut, uh, you kind of cut the time frame and so on. So it's not brute force in the sense of looking at every solution in the space of possible solutions. That's just impossible theoretically. But uh, I hear more refer to amount of resource I'm throwing at a problem. Right now, we starting to realize, okay, it's expensive to do it this way. Can we teach machines to learn from just one or two examples? 
So we don't give them 10 gigabytes of data. Right. So, for example, uh, what, what what is it called? Deep Blue, the, the machine that beat Gary Kasparov was like more or less 100% brute force. Like it would outcalculate every single move uh, possible. Like, I don't know, 20 million moves. Or it had 64 processors for every square. It had a separate processor computing this specific position. So it, it had to outcalculate him. It didn't have to outcalculate the game of chess, but just see deeper than he did. Exactly. And, and, and then... AlphaGo is very different. Yes, completely. And Alpha Zero is completely different from that yet. So exactly. So isn't that the the sort of the the decline of utility or usefulness of brute force? I mean, I'm just an ignorant guy here who's trying to make sense of it, and 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 showing that all those sort of sophisticated, elegant shortcut algorithms, learning algorithms, sort of prove that that the future is not brute force anymore. I, I think we just disagree on what we refer to. In one case, we're talking about looking at all possible solutions to the problem. In the second case, we're just talking about amount of resources I'm throwing at it. I see. Once we have separate words for those, I think we'll agree. I see. I see. Okay. Okay. That's very interesting. All right. So, um, Dr. Impolsky, we've been talking for a little bit over an hour here. Um, so unfortunately, we're going to have to bring our conversation to an end. But let me ask you again, what's the best place for people to find more about you and your work, perhaps? Uh, you can follow me on Facebook. You can follow me on Twitter. Just don't follow me home. It's very important. <laughs> That's brilliant. I should steal that and start using it, too, because I've been having some some weird emails lately. Um once again, the, the, the book is called Artificial Intelligence, Safety and Security. I suggest people check it out. But uh, whether about the book or whether about in general, we cover the diversity of topics, just like your book, which has like 27 or 28 chapters by diverse authors coming from diverse backgrounds concerned with sort of diversity of issues and problems and suggested approaches. What do you think should be our parting message today? What do you want to tell to our audience as perhaps the one thing or the most important thing that you suggest that they take away from this? So no matter what happens, it's to your advantage to know what's going on. Educate yourself, uh, understand what technologies are coming, what is already available, how it works, how it's likely to change economics, uh, workforce, impact on you. It will uh, allow you to pick better majors if you're a student, so you actually can graduate and get a job. If you're a professional, it will help you decide which direction to take to keep your job. Uh, if you're a scientist, it will help you secure maybe future success with funding and publications. So no matter where you are, uh, there is something you can learn about developments in AI, and I think it's probably the most impactful field. I'm probably somewhat biased, but uh, it seems like it has impact on all the other fields. You can no longer be doing, oh, I'm just a mathematician, I don't care about computation. So no matter who you are, I say educate yourself, and uh, a good book is a great way to learn. <laughs> Fantastic. So no matter who you are and what you do, educate yourself about the impact of AI. Future-proof yourself. Future-proof yourself. Wow. Dr. Roman Yampolsky, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you so much for inviting me yet again. I love your show. You are my favorite. Thank you. If you guys enjoy this show, you can help me make it better in a couple of ways. You can go and write a review on iTunes or you can simply make a donation. Thank <laughs> you.